Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Our call to worship comes from that song, Psalm 66, but the first part of that song. Scripture says this. Let the whole earth shout joyfully to God. Sing about the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you because of your great strength. The whole earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name. And we're going to do just that. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning. We're going to sing him 668 doxology. Let's sing this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. This time is something that you long for. It's just a cherished longing uh, to gather with God's people, to gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and we come with one purpose, and that is to acknowledge Him, give thanks to Him, and worship Him. And I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad you've chosen uh, this part, the good part, and the best part of starting our week off and just worshiping our Lord. And so we're here to do that, and we welcome you. If you are visiting, we just count that a privilege, and we're honored by that. We hope that your time uh, with us as we together worship the Lord will encourage you in your faith walk and, uh, and just ask God's blessing on this time together. Pray for yourself. Pray that the Lord will give you ears to hear and, uh, and a mind that will understand and that will apply uh, these wonderful truths that we're going to study today. So we welcome you this morning. We're going to pause for prayer, and as we pray, let's be in prayer for Brother Bernie Poe, who had a, a rough week this week, and then uh, was asked to pray for a, a Jackie Majors, who has is in a very uh, critical situation uh, with his health, and we're going to pray for him together. And then uh, let's pray for... Uh, the primary elections that are coming up. As you well know, we need to pray for those that are running for offices and, and just ask that God's sovereign will will be accomplished. And I hope you'll do your part by getting out and voting as these primaries will begin here soon. So let's pray over these things. Let's go to the Lord with our heads bowed and eyes closed. And if you have a, a matter in your heart, this is a good time to start your, your worship focused on the Lord, but just talking to Him and, and just um, make known through your words the matter that's on your heart and mind that's got you troubled or maybe it's something you just need to say, God, I just want to praise you and then fill it in. Lord, thank you for this moment in, in our part of worship that we beseech you and we seek you. We come, Lord, through the avenue of prayer that's it's hard to Imagine that we can talk to you and, um, and we thank you that you're the God who hears our prayers. And Lord, we pray that our moments together in this worship time, that, that Father, you'll give us an ear that hears the truth, a mind that recognizes the truth 
a will that desires to obey the truth and apply the truth. Change us today, Lord. We recognize that our greatest need is to be revived. And we pray for revival for the saints, for the church, for the sister churches all over our community. We pray for you to just do a wonderful work of revival in each one of us. Father, we pray for mercy for this county. We pray for an awakening in the mind and heart and soul of lost people all over this county. And Father, we pray uh, that the Holy Spirit will take the Word of God that's been planted and presented in many places all around this, this county. And Father, we pray today for those in need of just encouragement. We lift up Bernie and uh, Miss Judy Carter and Sue Sipple. We pray, Father, for Jackie Majors that you'll intervene and that your gracious will would be done in, in this life and that great grace will be there for this one and, and their family. We pray, Father, for the elections in our community, our state and nation coming up, these primary elections. We ask your blessings and uh, pray you'll be merciful, Lord, to, to this place we call our home, our country. Bless now, Lord, as we continue to worship through song, and we pray that your Holy Spirit, uh, Lord, will just guide us now. We pray he would not be grieved or quenched in any way, but today that Jesus will be exalted. And, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand once again. We're going to come together and sing him 163, Wonderful Grace of Jesus.
with me this morning to the book of 1 Peter. We will be in chapter 3 this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter three, chapter uh, chapter three, verse seven. The Lord declares this: Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. May we honor God with our marriages, and may our, our prayers never be hindered. Let's continue to worship. Our song for the month of May is entitled, This Is The Day. You may be familiar with the song, This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Well, City Light is the group that wrote this, has taken those words and put them into a new contemporary hymn. And I'm going to introduce that hymn to you this morning, and then we'll sing this uh, for the rest of the month. So I'm going to teach you the chorus, then we'll sing the chorus again and go through the song.
Psalmist writes about is the day, was the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And so every time you say that verse, this is the day the Lord has made. It reminds us the Lord originated that. The Lord is the author of that. And that day, because of that day, we have much to rejoice now. So that song, uh, I love that song. I'm glad we're going to be singing that throughout this month of May. If you have your Bibles and would like to Follow along with me. Our text will be from the Song of Solomon. So we're going to keep on the theme of the Song of Solomon, chapter 8. This month is the month that we're focusing on the family. Family focus. Today we're going to focus on marriage and uh, more specifically keys to a lasting marriage. Next Sunday we'll celebrate mothers. Uh, the Sunday after that, Wesley's going to have the charge of of dealing with how to keep our youth in the faith, and then I will close the month with how to keep our children in the faith. And so we're talking about marriage, mothers, munchkins, and munsters. No, I'm kidding, not munsters. But uh, anyway, we're going to be talking about that difficult phase of teenage years and the struggles of that. And you say, why are we doing that? Well. If you've watched anything of late, if you've observed anything, if you've been totally out of the news in the world or the nation, all you got to do is open your eyes locally. The family is under extreme attack. It always has been, but it is, especially right now. And the reason for that is the fact that God instituted the family. It's the very first institution that God created was the family in the book of Genesis. And we know that God then had a plan for a people. And that plan continued, and then there was the institution of, of the church. And then in between uh, the church and the family, there was the institution of government. So we've got these certain institutions that we realize God is the originator of them. The problem is, is that when the institution of the family disintegrates, it will automatically cause a demise to the government. You cannot have a strong government without strong families. Now on top of that, we also see not the destruction of the church, but we see the hindrance to the church when the family is under attack. The church will always survive. It is not going to be destroyed. God will always have his remnant. But when the family is attacked and when the family is going down the way we see it, it does create a hindrance 
to the institution of the church. I mean, just look around. The family has been taken away from the church body for the most part. Everything under the sun demands our attention and time today. Our men discussed this uh, Wednesday night about in our study with Dr. Tony Evans about idols. And, you know, we have this false connotation that idols are some little, you know, statue that we put in a home and we all go by and just bow down to it. And, you know, that seems bad. But I want to tell you, the idols of today are worse than those idols. At least during those days when they would bow down to some little image they put kept in the home, they also, in a way that wasn't good but better than we're doing, they still acknowledged there was a God. <laughs> they still tried to worship God or and serve their idols, today we don't even think about God for the most part in our society. We are bowing down at the altar of the idols of this world and they come in many different flavors and packages and it has literally hurt the home and it has hindered the church. Now we look today at the attack on the family. Marriage is our theme for today. Song of Solomon is a beautiful song that paints a picture of the beauty, intimacy, and wonder of marriage. But we see marriage under attack. The Bible emphasizes that marriage is an institution of God. He created it, therefore he has the sole right to say how it is to function and who marriage is to be for. And God says it is for one man and one woman. That's what he defines. Now, we've come along in our sophistication now, and we have said, oh no, marriage can mean many things. Marriage can be between two men or two women or two, uh, a, a human being and their animal or to a human being and their plants. You say, oh, that's far fetched. That's where we are. And so marriage has already taken a black eye in our society, and it is causing a repercussion that is far reaching. Now, we're not only attacking marriage, but then we are attacking next week the role of mothers. Used to be a time that it was a proud thing for a woman to state that her career was that she was a housewife or a mother. It wasn't many months ago I was filling in for a Sunday school class and I was talking to the youth about how to find God's will for your life and how to seek the Lord and I just happenstance asked the question, you know, what do you foresee maybe doing in life and do you have any thoughts? And they were, you know, teenage kids and, and one of our young ladies said, I want to be a mother. And I just was stunned. I have not heard a teenage girl say that to me in many, many years as I've been in the ministry. I said, what, what is it you really want to be? I want to be a mother. I was like, wow. <laughs> that used to be the norm. But we so demean motherhood, we so demeaned it that now people don't want to even say it. They feel like, oh, that just means I'm second class. And we have seen that we demean motherhood by the fact that we don't put much stock in children anymore. We don't have kids anymore. And the kids we have, we feel like they're expendable. So we just take their lives. And then we look at the situation of our children. We see the attack that as it begins on the family, it hits marriage, it hits motherhood, it begins to hit our children, our little ones. And now we're living in a day where there are liberal school boards and liberal teachers that feel that it is their necessary right to instruct our preschool and first and second grade kids matters of sexuality that are way too weighty for them to be handling. I was reading an article by Corey Ten Boom that she says when she was a young girl, that she was traveling with her father who was a watch repairman and they were traveling by train and she said two words came to my mind as a young girl. One word was the word sex. The other word was the word sin. So I decided to ask my dad who was a very godly man the question and I asked him, what is sex sin? And he just kind of looked at her and said nothing. The train came to its destination and he had a pack a, pack, a, 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 a suitcase that was filled with his tools and, and parts that he had for his trade. He laid it there in the floor and he said, Corey, pick up the pack and carry it. And she said, I reached down to try to pick it up and it was so heavy that I couldn't pick it up. And he said, Corey, I'd like to answer your question now concerning what you asked me. He said to her, Corey, this is a question that is too weighty for you to handle right now. 
You're too young to carry the weight of that type of information. You won't have to trust me as your father to carry the weight of that information. And when you're old enough to handle it, then you'll be able to understand what that particular matter is about. You know what we're doing today? We think we have to tell preschool and first and second grade kids that they need to know all the ins and outs of a world that is too heavy for them and we're robbing them of their innocence. And then on top of that, we have our blessed middle and high school students that have to go and sit in the class of liberal teachers that feel it is necessary for them to tell them, to tell their class their sexual preference and talk about their sexual activity. I don't understand the reason for that. Man, I tell you, I'm like one man who said when I was going through elementary school, I didn't even know my teacher was married. I was shocked the first time that I met their family. I sure didn't want to know about their personal life, and I sure didn't want to know about their physical relationship life, but now we seem to be living in a society that we're so attacking the home and marriage and motherhood we're coming for the children, we're coming for the, the youth of our day, and the family is under attack. And we need to get back to the originator of all of those things and see what he had to say about it. And we as families need to readjust and find ourselves getting closer and lining up with the standard of what the instructor says rather than what the liberal uh, press and the liberal government and the liberal school boards of our nation are pushing down our throat. That's where we are. And when we come to this passage, we realize that so Song of Solomon is a beautiful interaction between a man and his wife. This is literal. This is about a love relationship. And in chapter 8, we have the whole family involved in this relationship. We have a friend, we have uh, the Shulamite woman, we have her brothers, we have Solomon, we have all of them interacting. And here in this section, we see some keys that can lead to lasting marriages. Now, right off the bat, let me say this. I realize that in this room and in my live stream and other means, that there are many of us here that have been impacted by failed marriages. Either you've gone through one yourself, you may have a child that's been through one, you have a sibling that's been through one, or you have parents that have been through one. Today, I'm not here to talk about the matter of what, how, what the scripture says about all of those type of issues. I'm here to talk to you where you are right now. If you're in a marriage, you say, I've been married to this same person all my life, I'm here to speak to you. If you say, well, I'm in, a, I'm in my second marriage, I'm here to speak to you. If you say, here, I'm here, I'm single, I haven't been married yet, I'm here to speak to you. I'm here to say right now, today, nail a stake in the ground and say, we're going to follow the principles that are outlined in the scriptures. From this point, I'm going to abide by these, I'm going to apply these. And if it's your first marriage, second marriage, third marriage, no marriage, single, and you say, I have no desire to ever be married, or, or maybe you've been married and you're a widow and you say, I don't want to be married again, then hopefully you'll be a counselor to those that want to get married and you'll use these principles for your life. So what are they? Well, number one, number one, we must build on God's recognition of oneness. We must come to the place to see what the Bible says about intimacy in the marriage relationship. We must stop going to Google and, and uh, the internet to find out things about intimacy and get back to the book of intimacy and see what does God say about it. And here in chapter 8, verse 5, we see a beautiful description of how there can be oneness in marriage. And here's what it says. A relative is speaking and says this. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree that you're, there your mother brought you forth, there she who bore you brought you forth. Now in this one verse, we see something about the emphasis on oneness in marriage. Right off the bat, the word dependency comes to mind. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? Leaning. Leaning. Now in that day and time, the only person that had the right to touch a woman in public was either the father of a daughter or the brother of a sister. Even husbands did not touch their wives in an affectionate way in public. And then look what's happening. Who is this coming leaning upon her beloved? 
Here is a picture of dependency. Here is a picture of one that is enamored with their spouse. Here is a picture of a desire to be with that individual and they're unashamed. It's like they're saying, this is my husband and I love him and I'm proud of him. This is my wife and I love her and I'm proud of her. I want the whole world to know what a blessed person I am. And so oneness begins with a demonstrating to one another of a dependence on each other. But then number two, we also see the need of desire. He says, I awakened you under the apple tree. This is a remembrance. The apple tree would be in our kind of modern vernacular would be what we would call the home place. On my mother's farm in Arkansas, there's a place I can go to and I can say this is where the home place was. This is where the home house was. This is where my grandfather was born. I can tell you the spot and it's kind of like a, a chair spot. It is the, a place. Now in that day, there was a tree. The tree marked the spot of the home place. It marked the spot of remembrance. And here she is saying, this is the place where I was born and it has significance for me. But more than that, she says, but more importantly, this is the place where I fell in love. This is the spot where I fell in love with this one who I am enamored with, that I am dependent upon. He remembers, she remembers. There's desire. Oneness requires dependency and it requires desire, but it also requires a divine element. Because look what he goes on to say. There your mother brought you forth and there she who bore you brought you forth. This is an emphasis that God in His divine sovereignty allowed her to be born and He had a plan for her life. She was born with a purpose. This is the fact, this is an emphasis that there must be the realization of a divine destiny when it comes to relationship with the opposite sex, with a future husband, with a future wife. There is a divine involvement and this person realized it. And I tell you, when you get those three things going together, a dependency on one another, a desire for one another, and recognizing the divine involvement and influence in that relationship, it leads to a marriage that can experience genuine oneness. And folks, we need to remind our children that relationship within marriage is a very honorable and cherished thing. We need to recognize the Bible holds it highly. We need to recognize that the, the Bible uses terms such as holy when it comes to intimacy between a husband and a wife. Now, folks, preceding this chapter is chapter 7. And my wife is very glad that I didn't choose that chapter today to preach to you. Oh, I was very tempted. But I want to tell you, chapter 7, buddy, if you want to read a romance novel, come to the Bible. Chapter 7 here is Solomon that begins to speak and talk about this one in his life. He starts from the tip of her toe and he go to the top of her head. And I mean, he is just enamored with her. He is speaking of her qualities. He's speaking of the graces of her life. I love the way it starts with when he says, your feet, you, you, the, how beautiful are your feet in sandals. You say, why did he say sandals? Well, back in that day, they didn't put sandals on their women's feet, their wives' feet. You know why? They didn't want them going anywhere. They didn't want them running off. I mean, they said, hey, go hide those shoes. You're going to stay here. And here's a man who said, I have such trust in you that I put shoes on your feet. I'll never, I'll never forget my wife telling me the story that when she and her family moved to Stillwell, Oklahoma, where her dad pastored, she said one day her dad said, hey, y'all want to make a trip across the state line? He, they said, yeah. They were going into Arkansas. <laughs> they were going to go see how the Arkansas people live. Libby said, I was totally shocked when we crossed that state line. She said, I, I had it in my mind. I tell you, she'd been watching too much Dog Patch USA. Anybody remember Dog Patch USA? I mean, that was in her mind. She said, I thought we were going to cross the line. I was going to see girls walking down the streets with no shoes on and going to see guys spitting tobacco out their mouth and playing a banjo. You know, I mean, that's what she had in her mind. She said, we crossed that state line and they were wearing shoes. And here he says, my beloved wears sandals. I trust her. He goes from her feet to her thighs to her navel to her belly. I'm telling you, folks, there was a mystique about this woman. There were areas that she 
saw the importance of covering up and only having his eyes to see down the line when they fulfilled their vows to one another in holy matrimony. I tell you, we live in a day, like Dr. Rogers says, we're living in a day that we've gone from strapless clothes to now clothesless straps. I mean, it's, it's something. There's no mystique anymore. There's nothing left to the imaginations. And I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, maybe, maybe you know, these guys are saying, well, we got everything's out on the shelf. We kind of know what we're getting. Or, you know, just kind of go shopping here. That seems to be the day we're living. But not for this woman. She saw the mystique level. He talks about her legs of strength. He talks about a neck that spoke of purity, her eyes that spoke of holiness. He talks about her nose. I used to struggle with that when he said her nose was like the Tower of Damascus. I thought, that's really romantic, you know. I don't think my wife would be impressed if I came in and said, honey, your nose is like the Tower of, uh, of the Trade Center, you know, whatever. What does he mean there? Damascus was the power center. Uh, it was the place that uh, they were aware of trouble. And he says she's able to sniff out trouble. She recognizes when things aren't right. Her hair was like a crown. Now what does this teach us here about oneness, about dependency, enamored with one another, a desire for one another, a divine nature that's involved? It reminds us that we need to do four things to develop that. We need to talk. We need to touch. We need to spend time, and we need to keep each other on our thoughts. Here's a man that's talking, and his talking led to his touching. The more he talked, the more he wanted to be near. And when he wasn't near, he wanted time. He wanted more time. And when he wasn't near, she was on his thoughts. Guys, sometimes we do well in the midst of the day just to send a quick text and say, I'm thinking about you. Last night before we went to bed, I had to tell my wife how much I appreciated her being a mother and thanking her that she was willing to have four children in a day where a lot of people don't want to have any. I thought about the pain she went through. Let me tell you, yesterday, as I went out, see, my wife had the distinction of having her birthday on Mother's Day. She doesn't really like it because she feels like she's cheated out. But let me tell you something, it puts a lot of pressure on, on the husband because I want to come through, and it's struggling. I'm thinking, I, I want to make it good, and I'm out. And so yesterday, I said, I'm going shopping. And she just looked at me like, what are you shopping for? <laughs> I said, I'm Mother's Day, birthday. Well, what do you, well, I hadn't given you any ideas. And right before I left, here's what she said. I really need some of those uh, measuring spoons. I'm like, I'm not going to go buy measuring spoons. If we need some measuring spoons, go buy them. But I, that ain't going to be the birthday gift this year. You know what? As I left, I thought, that's been the level of my shopping all these years. Measuring spoons. So I went out and... Felt pretty good about myself. You'll find out next Sunday if I came through or not. But anyway, I went out and did my shopping. But I was driving down the road, and I had gotten the cards for Mother's Day and birthday and our mothers. And, and all of a sudden, it just flooded my soul. And I thought, I am a blessed man. I have a wife that's been willing to rear four children. Three of those by C-section. Most would have said, one and done, baby. <laughs> you know? And I just, it just, something overflowed me. And I said, God, I thank you for my wife. I thank you that I cherish my children, but they wouldn't be here if she wasn't willing. I wouldn't have my grandchildren that I love to death if it wasn't for the fact she was willing. Men, we need to talk, and we need to take time, and we need to let them know they're on our thoughts. And that means we have to focus on romance. You've got to learn to be romantic. You've got to have spontaneity and creativity. You have to have time where you recognize the inner beauty of this one that's in your life. You need to recognize the strength that they have and appreciate it. And if you have a weakness, work on it. Because there's an enemy out there that is attacking that. The enemy of sin is attacking the oneness that we can have in marriage. Men, guard your eyes. Guard who you look at. Guard what you think about. Guard where you go to on the internet. Recognize sin will destroy the oneness. Age will destroy the oneness. Now, I'm not talking about getting old. I'm talking about time. We take for one, each other for granted. We just take each other for granted rather than appreciating one another. We get forgetful about things that we should be saying and doing, and we get lazy. And we've got to battle because if we want a marriage that's lasting, we must build on the recognition of oneness. But number two. Number two, we must walk in God's plan of permanence. As I said in the beginning, I realized that we all represent many shapes and sizes and differences. We have been through different things in married life. And I realized that many of us could give different testimonies. But I'm saying to you right now, decide today that whatever state you're in, whatever marriage you're in, decide this is until death do us part. This is for permanence. Because look at what she says, verse 6. 
Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. She says, love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. He says several things about permanence. He said, number one, you're a seal on my heart and arms. What's inside and what's outside is mine. It spoke of a mark of ownership. You need to realize, lady, that you belong to him. And men, you belong to her. She owns you. You own her. You are sealed. Also, that permanent should be as strong as death. That means no circumstances should break that relationship and marriage vow. Until death do his part. What God has joined together, let no man or anything put asunder. She said the permanence of our relationship will be hard as a grave. That means we are determined to stand even when it's difficult. It will be like a fire that is consuming. And that is we will build on the, on the passion and, that is authored by God. Men, that means, and women, that means that you must have a passion for Jesus if you're going to have a marriage that is lasting. If your relationship with Christ is stagnant and lukewarm, your marriage is destined for stagnancy and lukewarmness. If you're not in love with Jesus Christ with all of your heart, you will not be able to love your spouse to the level that you could and God wants you to. There must be a passion for Jesus and it leads to what is unquenchable. He says waters cannot quench it. Waters cannot drown it. That means no matter how difficult life comes, no matter the calamities that you face, whether it's physical struggles, whether it's difficult emotional times or financial struggles or just personality clashes, it will not drown out the commitment that you've made to one another because ultimately, he says, it is priceless. What would a man give for love? If he gave all that he had, it would be utterly despised. I want to tell you, no job, no career, no fling, no affair, no passion, no pursuit is worthy of breaking up the relationship that God had divinely appointed you to be in. So number two, walk in God's plan of permanence. Then number three, live within God's boundaries. Live within God's boundaries. Verse eight, the brothers step in. We have a little sister and she has no breasts. What shall we do for her in the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we're gonna build upon her, a battlement of silver. And if she's a door, we will enclose her with boards of silver, cedar. What is he saying here? He is saying, we're involved. Family, get involved. Dads, get involved in your daughter's lives. Moms, get involved in your son's lives. Brothers, get involved in your sister's life. Sisters, get involved in your brother's life. There are the boundaries that need to be set before you get married. These brothers step in and said, we've got a little sister. And we're not just going to stand by and let any old yeehaw come to town and say, hey, I want to date your sister. What you up to, boy? Come on in here. Let's have a little talk. I'm the dad. I want to know what you're up to. What's your motives? Where do you think this is headed? What's your plans with this daughter of mine? She belongs to me. She's part of my family. You've got any ill intent? You can just leave here now. They get involved and they ask a question. So here we see some boundaries set before they get married. Number one, the family needs to be involved in their life. And there needs to be a plan that will helpfully guide this person in the future. They ask the question. They said, now, if she's a wall, we're going to build her up. Now, what does that mean? To be a wall meant she was pure. She was chaste. She had made the choice. And they said, we're going to adorn that. We're going to bless her for that choice. It leads to trust and freedom that can come in that life. But they said she also could be a door. Now, what does that mean? If she's a door, a door meant she was morally weak. A door meant she was, had a propensity toward doing something wrong. To be influenced, to go further than she should go in a relationship before marriage. And what did the brothers say we'll do? They said if our sister had the propensity to do something she shouldn't do until she has set her marriage vows, we're gonna board her up. <laughs> we're gonna lock her in. We're gonna step in, we're gonna surround her, we're gonna guard her, we're gonna protect her until she is able to come to an awakening. And I love the way that this young woman responds in verse 10. She says, I am a wall. I'm a wall. You know what she's saying? She said, I'm chaste. I'm pure. She proudly proclaims her virginity. Let me tell you something, folks. Being pure before marriage is not a divine preference. It is a divine command. 
It is a divine command. And the reason it's a command is because it leads to safety, it promotes trust, it leads to thankfulness in the life of the one who's made that choice. I got to thinking about this verse. What if some of our high school girls went to school tomorrow and got out amongst all their peers and said, hey, I got an announcement to make. And everybody's out there like, oh, what are they going to say? What is their announcement going to be? And they stood out in front of all their peers and said, I want you all to know that I am sexually pure. What do you think the response would be? I believe there would be laughter. There would be jokes. There would be derision among a majority of the people. Because we now have, have convinced our young people that that's old-fashioned. And they're suffering for it. Now, let me tell you, if they go out there and said, I got an announcement to make. Oh, what do you got? What do you got? I want you to know, as a young man, I've determined that I'm a girl now. Oh, praise, hallelujah. Or a young girl says, well, I've decided to be a boy now. There would be applause. There would be support. We are literally turning it upside down. We have right is wrong and wrong is right. And we applaud what is sinful and we make fun of and joke what is holy in our day. And here's a lady who stood up and said, I proudly proclaim that I have kept myself pure. Now, if you're single today, you need to recognize that that is a good place to be. Paul commends it in the book of Corinthians. It is a good place to be. You're not second class. And married people don't make people that are single feel like they're second class. Encourage them. Support them. God may have gifted them. He may have given them the spiritual gift to be a single person all of their life. And if he has, they need to live in that. But if you're here and you're single, say, you know, I really want to marry. All I can tell you to do is, is to do what this person does. They focus on being the person God wanted them to be and desired them to be. And they had to leave the timing with God with all the rest. She just said, I'm going to follow the precepts and principles of God's word. So we see the boundaries before marriage. And then we see the boundaries during marriage. What are boundaries during marriage? Once we've made our marriage vows. And let me just share with you four thoughts to us that are married. I would say, and I'm, I'm going to speak to the men, but I think nowadays, sadly, this applies to the women. All right, what, what is it? Avoid being alone with opposite sex. Don't be alone with people that are not your husband or wife. If you can help it. I realize work sometimes, you have to, you're dealing with people and but I guess I'm saying is don't let yourself get to the place that you kind of look forward to those moments. You try to find a reason to be alone with this person. You like it. Also, don't disclose ult- intimate feelings with somebody of the opposite sex. Don't talk to them about those areas. That's to be reserved for God and for your spouse. Number three, don't confide feelings with the opposite sex that's not your husband or wife don't confide in them don't tell them things you're you're, you're opening up yourself that can cause you to be a door and then don't eat alone with the opposite sex make a decision that if you have to have a meeting with a person that's not your husband or wife that you're going to take somebody with you get a friend get a co-worker Don't go and have a meal. That can be a very intimate time where you're sharing a meal with somebody. Make a decision that I am going to set these boundaries because I care this much about my relationship in my marriage. And then in closing, I know we're about out of time. Number four, agree. Agree with God's secret of commitment. The word commitment. When we look at this final verse... Verse 12, Solomon says, my own vineyard is before me. Uh, Or she's speaking to Solomon. She said, my own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who tend its fruit, two hundred. You who dwell in the gardens, the companions, listen for your voice. Let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Now, what do I see there? I see a commitment between two people. Decide today that the main thing that will lead and motivate you is the word commitment. I have counseled young couples 
before they got married. And I'll ask them a question. What is the thing that you believe is the key to a long-term marriage? Or what is it that attracted you to this person? What is it do you feel is the real, you know, stabilizing roots to cause your marriage to be strong? And most times they'll say love. It sounds so sweet. But it is so wrong. Love is not the key foundation for a marriage. Love is not the priority. Love is not. The key word in a marriage is the word commitment. I am committed to you. Because if love was the secret code, why is it so many people that started with we love one another. I love them. In a matter of a year or five years, they're ready to split. And what do they say? I don't love him anymore. It shouldn't have ever been based on love. It's based on a commitment. That's why in some societies, the moms and dads decide who is going to marry their daughter. You say, that's a weird thing. They, they don't even know each other sometimes. They come together. And you know what it's built on? It's built on a commitment of trust that their parents knew what they were doing. They made a commitment. And because of the deep commitment, it usually leads to a blossoming love that develops. You see it in the Old Testament. Often, that's how it happened. And I want to say this. If you make a decision that you have a total yieldedness of your life to Christ... Or the word commitment. I don't use that often. But if you're committed to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you are yielded to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that is the number one priority. You're going to be committed to Him. I want to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to have a commitment to your spouse that's going to lead to a love that is unlike any of your peers will ever have. Because you've decided. I'm going to let commitment lead to a deep gratitude for all God has done. His divine initiative in all this, the divine boundaries. It will lead to a deep level of relationship between the two. Commitment. Agree with God's secret of commitment. You know, there used to be a day when the boys would be out playing and roughing around and just playing what little boys play. And sometimes the question would arise and say, hey, what does your dad do for a living? And they'd say, oh, my dad does this. My dad works here. You know the question the boys asking each other now when they play together? Where does your dad live? Do you know where your dad is? Do you know who your dad is? That's the questions that are being asked today. You know why? Because we've let the word commitment disappear from our vocabulary. A take it or leave an attitude when it comes to marriage. No commitment and therefore no passion. No deep abiding love and it leads to the Demise of a family unit. You know, I was watching something. Sometimes I'll get to watch something. Libby said, what are you watching now? Because, you know, I can't find anything to watch. I like sometimes just sit down and let my brain go dead for a while and watch something. The other day, I, I saw this documentary about people that are on death row. I said, man, Brad, is you, you messed up. You know, and I was sitting there. I was watching this documentary about people on death row. And it struck me. They would have this person who's in prison for life. And they began to talk about what they did. And then they would go back. And start from the beginning. And what shocked me was so many of those, they had pictures of them when they were children. They just looked like little kids that run around our church. Little innocent children. And those children found themselves in a home where either the husband, I mean the dad or the mother, had either left or the marriage was just in turmoil. And, and, the, and the mother or dad they were living with was in one relationship after another after another. And they were just lost in the shuffle. They were abused by, uh, by step-parents. And, and, and they just found themselves as though they were just the forgotten. Until they found somebody that showed them an interest. And they led them down a path that was evil and destructive. It all started because of the demise of that family unit in the marriage. And folks, we need to build strong homes. And it starts with strong marriages. If you're here today and you want a strong marriage, it starts, number one, with you saying, I need a Savior. I need Jesus Christ as my Lord because I've seen too many shipwrecks. You can't do it in human strength, human wisdom. 
You have to start with the dependency upon Christ that will then help you to develop a marriage and a home that can be lasting. It won't be without problems, but you'll be way ahead of the game because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Come to Christ today. I'd like to lead you to Jesus today if you're here and you've never been saved. If you're here and you say, Brother Brad, I'm saved, but my marriage is hurting. I've harmed it. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've been letting my mind wander to places it shouldn't wander. I've been watching things I should not watch. And it is causing a slow decay within the marriage relationship in my home. You need to repent of that. We're not going to have an open repentance this morning, okay? You may need to go to God and, and probably say, Oh, God, forgive me for what I've done, what I've watched, what I've looked at. I repent of my sin and make it right with God and then develop and rebuild that relationship with your spouse. You need to do that today. Repentance is necessary in the life of many of us as Christians. Our homes, our marriages are hurting because of unconfessed sin. Men, you need to do it. Women, you need to do it. You still want to be flirtatious with men? You like that attention? You like the way you kind of get their eye? You need to go to God and say, God, forgive me. Help me to see that only should desire the eyes of my husband. I repent of my fleshliness. I repent of my sin. I want my marriage to be super strong and stable. I want it to flourish. Why? Some of you need to get with God. Repent of that attitude. And repent of that sin. And repent of that desire to draw attention to yourself. Make this right with the Lord. We're going to have an invitation. You say, I, I need to be saved, Brother Brad. Then come right now. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. And I'd love to lead you to Christ if you've never been saved.